For those of you just joining us, don't worry. You really haven't missed much. Last video was focused on the high concept of the game I'm looking to make, but in actuality I had little more than a basic character controller, a barely functional inventory system, and a checklist of what I need to do for this video. Now, one month later, I can firmly say that most of my time has been spent learning how to better use the tools at my disposal, and how to better go about restructuring my project. Which actually gets me into my first topic, restructuring the player controller and state machine. After I put out that first video, a good chunk of my first week was spent learning the solid design principles and breaking up my giant player script into multiple smaller scripts that work together. I'm still not happy with this implementation. It seems inefficient to have so many mono behaviors on the same game object, but if nothing else, the code is now compartmentalized into functional groups. This includes some new behaviors we'll touch on later, but one of the simpler things was setting up interactions with objects other than boxes. Watch, I can press this button and it does a thing. That was a fairly straightforward task to do, though, once I made an interface. Now, you may ask, hey, what's an interface? And to that, I have to say, excellent question. I have no idea. An interface is used in cases where multiple scripts will need the same methods, albeit different implementations of them. It's somewhat like an angry manager saying, hey, I don't care how you do your job, I only care that the work gets done. Within my player scripts, the interface is used by the state machine to inject dependencies, as well as subscribe to the relevant inputs from the action map. Big words and it kind of sounds complicated, but there really isn't all that much going on. Most of the logic in each script is specific to that script only. A better example is with my implementation of slots and making them play nice with our inventory grids from before. I have an interface that describes what methods will need to be in an inventory handler, and my inventory controller points to an instance of the interface rather than an instance of the grid now. This allows the same functions to be called in both a grid and a slot, but with very different logic within each function. It also allows functions to be in one class but not the other which I used to my advantage for setting up an equipment manager later, but more on that later. From there, the next big thing I figured out was inheritance for the data to be stored in various kinds of items. The base item data scriptable object is still in use and will act as my generic item that doesn't do a ton from now on. From there, I have new scriptable objects inheriting from item data, namely weapon data, armor data, and armor module data. I also have subtypes of armor data to distinguish between helmets, pants, and chest pieces. With slots figured out and redoing filters to work with this new method of distinguishing item types, I needed to figure out how to have items spawning in the world. I have chests, but at startup they were empty. I needed a method for stuff to be in them before we enter runtime. This lets me analyzing the inventory grid code to understand what's really going on when an item gets inserted or taken out of a grid. See, when we manually place an item on the grid, we're assigning a reference of a specific instance of an item to a location on the 2D array of the grid. Or in other words, if we have a 2x2 item and a 4x4 grid, every tile the item occupies needs to point to the same instance of the item. So how do we assign that before runtime? Arrays do not get defined until runtime, and you can't assign objects to an undefined array. At first I considered making the arrays within a grid static, which would define the length prior to runtime, before learning that would be an awful way to go about it, because it would likely eat up a ton of memory. Even if we were to do this, we then run into problem number two. We don't want to set the value of a cell directly, because doing so would create a new instance of the item we're trying to set, and doing so would cause the effect you see on screen now, because the top left cell acts as the position anchor for the rest of the item. Then I remembered that inventory item stores its own location on a grid. If I go ahead and put the item inside a grid, on start, I can get that coordinate and pass it to place item. In the event of an overlap with an existing item, I pass the item to find space for object, which finds the next best spot. If I assign a bunch of items to 0, 0, that function will instead move the items around to properly fit everything. In the event of not finding a location, it tries one more pass with the item rotated to see if it can fit in sideways. If so, it gets inserted like that, and if not, overflowed items get deleted. Having items only in chess is somewhat limiting, though. I'd like it if items could be found or dropped on the ground. Manually dropping an item was easy. I added a prefab to the item data to represent each kind of item. When I want to drop an item, I spawn the prefab right in front of the player and attach the inventory item to it, and then clear the item's data from whatever grid it came from. However, to pick an item back up, I needed to know where exactly it was getting inserted into. We have more than a dozen grids of various sizes, and if one gets full, we want to automatically try the next one. For this reason, I created what I'm calling the multi-grid manager. Right now it has three parameters, a list of the grids it's managing, an integer to represent insert priority, and an integer to represent extract priority. The inventory controller has a list of multi-grid managers, which is sorted by insert priority. The idea is that when you pick an item up, you want to put it in your backpack first, unless it's full. Your pack would then try every grid it is managing to see if there's space. If so, 
cool, insert the item and we're done. If not, the multi-grid manager returns false, which tells the inventory controller to try the next manager in the list. It will do this until all multi-grid managers have been tried. With that, we can now pick items back up from the ground, and if we don't have enough space, it just gets dropped right in front of us again. I also added a second pass on pickup to check for valid locations for an item if it's rotated, just in case there's no space in its normal orientation. Since we're going to have loads of items, weapons, armor pieces, and so on, I began work to make a few tools to help organize all that information. More specifically, I created custom inspectors for each type of item data. This is primarily to make it easier to read what we're looking at. To do this, I took another crack at UI Toolkit and UI Builder, and it was actually fairly simple. There's even a button under the Create menu to make a new editor window. Using that as a base, I opened the UXML file in the UI Builder and simply laid out what fields I needed for any specific item. Changing the binding path means it will edit the value of a variable with the same name. For example, with the height and width fields, I copy the name of the variable into the binding path, and boom, it just works. From there, I had to append new information to old information. Inspectors for subtypes were not drawing inspectors for their base types. I didn't want to have duplicates within UXML file, so I created an instance of item editor, passed it the target, and used the visual element it returned as the base for the new display. I then simply attached my new editor info to the end, and bish bash bosh we gucci. The one exception to the simplicity is the goddamned object field. I'll spare you the rant, but I spent an entire evening trying to set the type of a couple of those guys. The UI editor asked for the assembly definition of the type. For things native to Unity, this is easy. For example, a sprite is just unityengine.sprite. But for custom types, this doesn't seem to work, at least within the assembly dash C sharp assembly, which is the default location Unity puts all your scripts into. On screen, you can see all the different things I've tried and the fix to get it to work properly? These two lines of code per field. First, we query for the object by name in the visual element, and then we set the object type through code. You can't do it in the UI builder for some reason, so this is the only way I could figure it out. <sighs> anyway, it's working now. The plan going forward is to create a proper item database, which allows for the easy creation and spawning of items. With the way I've got this set up, I think I'll be able to embed these inspectors into another editor window to achieve this. Without it, I have to go through the process of manually setting up the game objects for any new item, assigning the item data, sprite, which inventory item script is needed, and so on. Oh, speaking of, that's an alright segue into our next topic, the Equipment Manager. Because weapons and armor have subtypes of item data, I went ahead and also made subtypes of inventory item to store any instance-specific data to an item. For example, let's say I have two different kinds of helmet one that can attach a flashlight, and one that cannot. I can create this distinction by tweaking settings in the armor data of the scriptable object. However, I don't want to actually do the attachment of the flashlight within the scriptable object, since all helmets of a type derive from the same scriptable object. If I did, putting a flashlight on one helmet would put a flashlight on all helmets of the same type. Instead, I'm storing that information within the relevant item script. In this case, inventory armor item, which holds a list of stored modules. This way, two helmets can be of the same type with different attachments. Weapons have a similar script, but it's not as fleshed out yet, but it does pave the way for weapon attachments in the future. Cool, so I have slots which we established earlier, and we have items which hold customization information. So how do we actually have a slot equip something to the player? Well, our equipment manager has a few lists. One of them is the slots our equipment manager is managing, another is the items within those slots, and the last is a list of modifiers to be applied to the player. I have two chains of logic which equip and unequip items respectively. Both are called from the item slot via broadcast, and is fed a struct as a parameter containing the relevant item and which slot is getting changed. If it's an armor slot, we then read what modifiers are on the item and update our modifier list accordingly. More on weapons in a minute, as they essentially do the same thing, just instead of modifiers it updates a different list. The intent, as far as armor goes, is to mimic what I wanted Halo Reach's armor customization to be back in the day. You can put all kinds of gadgets on your Spartan, and in lore they would actually do stuff. However, in gameplay they don't actually do anything, because it would be difficult as heck to balance around every player's abilities. But, because we aren't going to have competitive multiplayer, and because our levels are procedurally generated, we aren't going to have such a weakness. I expect there to be three different kinds of armor module that can be equipped. The first is straight stat modifiers that buff things like move speed. The second is passive modifiers that augment your basic actions or provide you with more information than normal. 
For example, one could let you sprint in any direction like a weirdo instead of only being able to sprint forwards. Or uh, you may get a sensor package that gives you night vision or a motion tracker or something like that. And active abilities, which allow you to do things you can't by default, such as advanced mobility, interacting with special objects in the environment, or directing ally NPCs to prioritize certain targets. This may get expanded into even modifying the storage of a rig down to individual pockets. After all, if I can equip one big backpack, why can't I equip a dozen tiny pouches? However, right now armor modules do absolutely nothing, because I still have to figure out how I want to structure stats. Anyways, on to weapons. For prototyping, I'm using this pack of weapons from the Unity Asset Store, which I think I picked up from a Humble Bundle some time ago, if I remember correctly. And ta-da, you can hold them. Like I said, the Equipment Manager inserts weapons into a different list, and that list is the script for the player's hands. You can scroll through the currently selected weapon within the list of those which are equipped. Clicking even causes the weapon to fire. What, you don't see it? Ah, one sec. There you go. I could have gone ahead and set up breakout shooting, but I'd like to give weapons the special treatment and set up a system for ballistics and environment penetration. As a result, I'm going to make that project all on its own. You can also notice that I have weapons way based on the movement of the camera. Rather than shooting from the center of the camera like most games do, I want to have somewhat realistic handling, so I'm planning on having the shot properly come out of the barrel of your gun. That, combined with some procedural recoil, means you'll have to pick your shots to keep your weapon under control. I also added inertia to move the gun off-center whenever you change direction, but I'm having trouble getting the weapon to recenter after a short period of time. The most elegant part of this entire system is how I'm preventing the weapon from clipping through walls. See, in most FPS games, it's not a big deal to re-render the weapon in front of whatever object we're clipping into. This is a perfectly fine way of doing it, like 95% of the time. If we pop into a game such as Halo, equip a long weapon, and run into a wall, we can see the gun just fine from our player perspective. However, if you look at it from somebody else's perspective, you can see the barrel clipping through the wall. This isn't a big deal gameplay-wise for Halo, because it does what a lot of games do and break cast from the player's camera. Since you can't see through the wall, you can't shoot through it. But I'm going to have my raycast come from the barrel of the gun, and so I need to physically turn it to stop it from going through the wall. Otherwise, I could just poke the barrel through and shoot things on the other side. To prevent this, I have a raycast coming from in front of the player, and a clipping distance for each weapon. If there's nothing getting hit by the raycast, all is good, we keep our weapon fully extended. However, if the raycast hits something, we determine a percentage of the clipping distance from the player and lurk between pointing straight ahead and pointing the gun off to the side. If we're around halfway the distance, the gun will point off at a 45 degree angle. I still need to re-render the weapon on top of the environment to keep minor clipping from happening, like this, but overall I'm satisfied with this implementation. Now in the last video I mentioned that June is a pretty busy month for my family, and I ended up taking a week-long trip during the middle of it. I couldn't do any major development at the time, so I used that off time at night to make simple improvements that aren't critical for development, but could certainly help you guys see what's going on in the video. Namely, I made custom icons for each type of item data and some of the scripts that I expect there to be multiple instances of at a given time, like grids, slots, and inventory items. I also went ahead and used Blender on my laptop to make a few basic models so that everything isn't just gray cubes. For this character you see, as well as the models for the various armor pieces, I'm using the Vanguard character from Mixamo, a free library of models and animations from Adobe. Upon returning from vacation, I went ahead and imported them into my project and got them set up for use. The last thing I wanted to do before working on the video was get some character animations working. For this, I imported the Pro Rifle Pack, again from Mixamo, and set up an animator controlling the blend tree for the walk and run cycles for 8-directional movement. This doesn't include the aiming angles for the top half of the body, so I made them from the first frame of the idle animation. I then created an avatar mask to apply the poses to the upper half of the body. And it seems to work fine. I can bob my head up and down like a character from Red vs. Blue. Let's try walking. Ah, crap. I'm not quite sure what the issue is. I tried remaking and reimporting the poses with different settings. I've tried giving root control to the aiming mask. Uh, I've tried setting up the aiming as an additive layer rather than an override layer, and I spent around a day and a half trying to figure this out. Um, I mean, games have been doing this for 20 plus years, so I know it can be done. And what I've deduced is I think it's an issue with how Unity handles humanoid avatar masks. More specifically, with humanoid characters, you can mask off different limbs to define how you want animations to be applied. This works as expected for arms and legs, but with the torso, you can't mask off individual bones. 
Since the hips are considered part of the torso, the two layers end up interfering with each other. Either the walking animation controls the hips and it causes the entire upper body to wobble, or the aiming poses control the hips and it causes the legs to go off kilter. If I convert the rig from humanoid to generic, I'll need to re-import the animation so that they actually work with it, and then remake the animation controller as well. I had originally avoided using inverse kinematics to solve this problem because it seemed like an overkill solution, but after watching a few tutorials on the subject, it seemed easier than I anticipated. I got it working partially, but not to the level I want. And without implementing any scripts, it still seems quite a bit wonky. Um, I'll keep tinkering with it, but it, as of right now, it's a low priority to figure out. Really, I just wanted this set up. That way you guys weren't looking at a blue capsule this entire time. But that's everything I managed to get done in a month's time span. Uh, I don't want to be a tutorial channel. However, some of these things that I've had to figure out don't have very good resources on them. When I have a few more devlogs out and think I need a viewership boost, I may consider doing some of these more niche tutorials because I know somebody out there is going to be trying to figure them out too. I'm going to try and get the next video done in the span of about two weeks. It won't be as jam-packed filled with stuff, but hopefully we'll be more focused. Specific things for next video I want to include are going to be finishing up the item database to help automate item creation, finishing up the implementation of armor modules, which itself will require the implementation of stats, setting up a method for the player to change what modules are on their armor, fixing player inertia, both for the player's body and for what weapon they're holding, and then maybe redoing the inverse kinematics for the player. Um, again, that's not critical, but I think I have an idea that might work. Uh, the next video after that is going to be all about the weapons, damage, and ballistics. If you guys want to support the project, please subscribe to stay up to date. Like video, comment, do all that stuff for the YouTube algorithm gods. Actually telling your friends and getting the word out, it, it does mean a lot to me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to see you guys in two weeks. I'm going to get right to it, and uh, you guys have a wonderful day. Have a great holiday for the 4th of July. All that jazz.